All right, good morning, everyone. Good, 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 good. I always wanted to do this. Can I have one Whopper cheese, please? <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to do a session called The Famous 14. Now, before I get started on that, um, as you can see, this is a, a session that's been presented at Cisco Live. Uh, it's a session that I created three years ago, and it started with a, a session called Seven Ways to Fail as a Wireless Expert. Now, how did I get to seven ways to fail as a wireless expert? Um, basically, as you've seen, 80% of the Wi-Fi that we see out there is bad Wi-Fi. I mean, there's a website on it by uh, Eddie Ferrero, badfi.com. And I wanted to give something to the audience to do um, best practices on Wi-Fi. And oh my God, it was boring. <laughs> So I decided, you know what, I'm going to flip it around and I'm going to uh, show seven ways how to do Wi-Fi wrong. And I submitted it to the Cisco Live organizations and they said, you sure? Are you sure you're going to submit a session called seven ways to fail as a wireless expert? No one will show up. Well, for three years in a row, it was the most popular session <laughs> and that made me to create another one, which was seven new ways to fail as a wireless expert. And then I got the invite for today and they asked me, can you do your seven ways to fail? And I said, sure, I can do that. Can you also do your seven new ways to fail? Sure, okay. How much time do we have? Uh, you get about 45 minutes and after you see you got 35 minutes. <laughs> so I'm gonna do Two one and a half hour sessions in 35 minutes. Okay, so if I'm going a little bit fast, you know why that is. Um, what we're going to talk about? Well, basically, there's now uh, 14 ways to fail as a wireless expert, and basically, what I want you to learn is how not to fail. Uh, I want it to be uh, interactive. I want it to be a little bit fun, and um, I have in no way in mind that I'm going to teach you something new. Okay. You guys are far more experienced and knowledgeable about Wi-Fi than I am. The only thing that I'm giving you is a tool to talk to non-Wi-Fi people. Okay? How can you explain to a person that's not in the wireless industry why what they're doing is wrong? How can you start the conversation with the admins as you've just seen? That's what I want to give you. Um, and the reason for that, that this is the three biggest fears in our generation. Uh, if I see any of those three icons, I get nervous. Uh, and I'm, I think I'm not the only one. So the big problem is today, if the Wi-Fi is down, well, basically the world collapse. So this is me. Um, again, I'm also on, on Twitter. And yes, it is the wireless industry that got me on Twitter. Um, I've worked as an end user for three years. I worked at a water facility company. I worked as a field engineer with a partner. Uh, by the way, I did uh, uh, IP telephony back then. Uh, I worked for a distributor called Comstore. And uh, I'm with Cisco now eight years. Uh, I started on the 1st of October 2010. For me, that was a very special day because it was 011010. <laughs> Finally, someone that understands that it's funny. <laughs> I'm talking to my Cisco colleagues and they're like, so? <laughs> uh, this is uh, my wife and my kids. Uh, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, uh, I'm a runner. You might not believe it, but I'm a long distance runner. Uh, I do mountain biking, scuba diving, snowboarding, and I'm a Wi-Fi enthusiast, and I think uh, you are as well. I'm that guy that walks around on an airport looking at the ceiling where the access points are installed. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you guys do that too, all right. So, a lot of times can be saved uh, uh, for the normal session. When I normally present this uh, to, to, to the larger audience, I have a lot of people in the room that are not Wi-Fi people at all. So we have to explain that Wi-Fi is a, a wireless hub and not a wireless switch, that it's half duplex, carry sense multiple access with collision avoidance versus collision detection. And the good news is that they can save all that time with you. So we can immediately go into the good stuff about uh, uh, the fails. Uh, we know about the standards, we know about the, uh, the, the frequencies and the channels, so I can skip all of that. So, we are ready right away to move into some fills. Something wrong? Ooh. All right. Fill number one. Fill number one is to forget about those channels. 
And it sounds so obvious. I mean, it's 2018. And everyone knows nowadays that we should use channel 1, 6 and 11, right? Still, it's the most common mistake. I did a scan here, today. <coughs> most access points are on channel 7. Really? So, using the wrong channel is fail number one. And, and basically what you see here is a friendly fellow that parked his car on channel 4. And you take out two uh, parking spots. Uh, if you look at it a, from a Wi-Fi perspective, this is how it looks like. You got channel 1, 6, and 11, and a friendly fellow that put his access point on channel 4. By the way, I took this picture in a Cisco office. <laughs> in the UK. <laughs> um, so, channel 4. Um, we could do a thing called containment. So if you have an access point that is, that is on the wrong channel, you could do a th thing called containment, right? That is, that's really fun to do. Uh, by the way, it's illegal in most countries. And if you want to go back to the car perspective, then this is what you're doing. <laughs> it's fun, but not very useful. So film number one is really about the incorrect uses of channels. And uh, right now, I want to uh, uh, show uh, some of the hotels that I stay. Uh, so this is typically a hotel uh, when I'm, uh, so I, I, I work for Cisco EMEAR. Uh, my headquarter office is in Amsterdam, but I live close to the Belgian border. So if I have to do an early morning meeting in Amsterdam, I actually stay in a hotel. And this is the Wi-Fi you get in the hotel close to the Cisco office. For the people that know Amsterdam, there's a blue tower next to the A2, yeah? So this is the hotel Wi-Fi you get there. 802.11g, 54 megabits per second. One spatial stream, and it looks very interesting from a coloring perspective on the 2.4 gigahertz band, but this is not how to do it, right? And on 5 gigahertz, there's really nothing. This is um, Wi-Fi in a hotel in uh, Dublin, and uh, you can actually see uh, channel bonding on 2.4. Channel bonding is a great feature, and it was part of the 802.11n standard, but they made one mistake. They didn't say it was for five gigahertz only. So it is possible to do that in some uh, uh, consumer grade access points to do channel bonding on 2.4. And this is what you get. So that's basically what you get when you put your home Wi-Fi router in an enterprise environment. Now to go into more details about um, um, the Wi-Fi in hotels, I have one more hotel. This is uh, the hotel when I'm staying in um, uh, Milpitas. Milpitas is in San Jose. Uh, that's close to our headquarter. And uh, this is a very large hotel chain. And um, this is the Wi-Fi that you're getting there. And keep in mind that it's close to the smartest and the brightest wireless guys in the industry. Not just from Cisco, also the guys from Maruba, Ruckus, Ubiquiti, everyone is there. And this is one of the bigger hotel chains in the Wi-Fi that you get. So I went downstairs to the, talk to the, uh, to the uh, manager of the hotel and I said, you have a problem with your Wi-Fi? And she said, we know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's a good first step. <laughs> so, um, um, I, I talked to her, I explained her, and uh, I, I gave an explanation, and uh, I, I, I visualized that, and I put it into my first submission for Cisco Live, and it was declined by the Cisco organization, but I'm going to use it here. <laughs> no one from Cisco here, right? You? Okay. Please don't mention my name. <laughs> all right, so, so uh, I think um, we are all, uh, uh, most of the, the, the people in the room are men, and, and so you can relate to a thing what I call the urinal dilemma. <laughs> you know what is a urinal, right? That's this thing, okay. So let's say you walk into a room and there are three urinals. All is good. <laughs> you walk into this room and you're the first, you just go stand in the middle, <laughs> right? That's what we do, we take the middle one. All good. Second person comes in, no issues, and the third person, we all have our own space and we do our thing, right? But now, there are not three urinals, there are 11. And you're the first man coming in, you take one. 
Okay, I'll take this one. Second person coming in, you're gonna stand as far as possible from the other one. <laughs> That's what we do, right? Third person. Actually, I've got an exception to that. You got an exception? Not an exception. There was a guy um, on Five Live talking about going into a urinal in Barcelona, and the first one was taken. There were 11 urinals. The first one was taken, nobody else. And he saw that it was um, um, Rafael Nadal. So we can wait until our next week. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, I didn't calculate that one in. <laughs> so more people coming in, and, and this is the moment when it's, it, it's starting to become a little bit crowded. But you can see now, you are the next person coming in. Where are you gonna stand? It's gonna get awkward because you have to stand next to someone. But the more people coming in, the more awkward it becomes, right? Especially if someone starts talking. <laughs> You don't talk, we, no talking, right? So we made an agreement and we said, even though there are 11 urinals available, we only use one, six, and 11 because the other ones are overlapping. Yeah. So best practices, only one, six, and 11 on 2.4, use five gigahertz as much as possible. Uh, dynamic cha channel assignment, dynamic bandwidth selection, use RRM algorithms and do not use maximum power. Okay, I'm gonna introduce a next thing to you. Uh, I call it the simple rules, okay? And the simple rules are 14 simple one-liners to help you memorize and to pass on uh, uh, what's the best practice. So, simple rule number one, lead with a channel plan. All right, fill number two, maximum power. Putting an access point on maximum power is um, a wrong, decision. However, a lot of people do it and the, the reasons that they give me is uh, I only have one access point. Uh, if I put my access points on maximum power, I need less access points. Uh, I'm designing for coverage. Yes, I still have that conversation. Yeah. Uh, my site survey sa tool says all green. Uh, that's, I love that one. See, yeah, I got full coverage everywhere. It's all green. Uh, that, it doesn't work like that. And uh, uh, the, then there's another option where uh, the maximum power is the default. And there's a guy named uh, Jason Hintersteiner, and, and he said it perfectly. He said, setting transmission power is like drinking scotch. The right amount is great, but more does not mean better, and too much will make you sick. Thank you, Jason. So putting an access point on maximum power is not the right thing. So fill number two is putting APs on maximum power. And the, the simple rule, too much power isn't good for anyone. Talking also about a certain president in the United States. <laughs> Fill number three, 2.4 gigahertz, still the most important. Plain and simple, no. Some people will go as far and say it's that, and that's, I would not agree to that. However, you would no longer design for 2.4 gigahertz only. Uh, but with 802.11ax coming, 2.4 gigahertz becomes really important again. So it, it's really important for you to uh, uh, keep that into mind. Um, but designing just for 2.4 is not how to do it. So the simple rule here, start with 5 gigahertz on the test and let RRM and FRA do the rest. RM, radio resource management, FRA is the flexible radio assignment. Fail number four, a favorite one, placements. Really? Does it matter? Yes, it does. So, um, access points behind uh, metal tiles, uh, uh, access points with the antennas in all directions behind a metal wire, uh, protecting an access point. <laughs> Very well protected, absolutely, yeah. Uh, I spoke to a university yesterday and they had it like this. It's very common in education. And, <sighs> It really does matter. So some examples of where it's well done. Uh, this is a picture I took myself in the London subway. London subway is a, a pretty difficult environment, but these access points, the antennas are pointing down. That's really an uh, important highlight here. And here's another example. This is the uh, airport in Austria, in uh, Vienna. And uh, you can't see it on the picture, but it's a metal wire and there's a, a thick wooden plate behind it. Take some, uh, uh, some absorption. Some, some, some examples uh, of not so well done. Um, I was not aware 
so, so I know our products, our Cisco products pretty well. Um, but apparently we have a feature in our access points called stacking. <laughs> But everyone knows that stacking should not be done here, but should be done in the wiring closet. <laughs> and if you're going to do outdoor Wi-Fi, I mean, why, why spend so much money on an outdoor AP if you can do it the MacGyver way? <laughs> antennas, yes. Uh, there's a big um, area of uh, attention for antennas. Uh, two different antennas on one. And um, a literally a situation where someone said, uh, we spend a lot of money on your access points, uh, but they're not performing. And you come on site and they saved on the antennas. <laughs> it's not entirely the wireless fault uh, in that case. So some best practices here. Put your APs horizontal. They are designed for horizontal placement because of the polarization. Below obstructions, a minimum of one meter away from obstructions with the right type of antenna and only one type of antenna. A minimum of three meter away from each other. Uh, not too high. After four meter, you should uh, do uh, special uh, implementations like uh, uh, antennas. Don't put them behind a metal cage and outdoor APs with the outdoor coverage. Um, simple rule here. It's like in real estate, location, location, location. So fail number five. Fail number five is about not giving enough attention to uh, security. And um, I think this is still a very interesting website. Uh, you, you can try it yourself. It's called wiggle.net. On wiggle.net, you will find all the wireless uh, networks that have been uh, um, scanned on for the past uh, 20 years, I think. An interesting fact is that still, uh, today the number is 53%. 53% of the networks are on WPA2. That means that 47% of the wireless networks are not properly secured. Okay? So it's a very interesting website to, to look on for yourself. Another interesting thing to go uh, onto this website is if you type in the address of your, your home, you will find all your neighbor uh, wireless networks, including your own and it will tell how that one is secured as well. So it's an interesting one to have a look. So not enough attention for security is fail number five. WPA2 is the bare minimum. Uh, with CCMP, don't use TKIP, and the reason for that is not because TKIP is not secure, but the moment when you enable TKIP, it, it falls back on 54 megabits per second. So in situations where you need to have TKIP, which is primarily in the case of older barcode scanners, the recommendation is to give them a separate SSID. WPA2 personal is for personal, okay? Uh, in an enterprise environment, use 802.1x, uh, use role-based accents with, for instance, ICE or ClearPass, uh, use wireless intrusion prevention, and use a VPN if you're on public Wi-Fi. Um, I think I'm not the only one person in this room, uh, so I travel a lot, okay? Uh, I travel a lot, I'm, I can be found on the airport two, three, four times a week, and some people go shopping on the airport, I scan people Wi-Fi. <laughs> and I'm not the only one. I'm pretty sure that there are more people in the room that, that do that. And it's fun, um, right? <laughs> um, but recommendation, put a VPN uh, also on your, uh, on your cell phones uh, to, uh, to connect on, uh, on, on public Wi-Fi. Simple rule, security is a process and not a product, okay? Just buying a box doesn't secure your network. It's a process, and it's a process that should be throughout uh, all parts of your networks. Uh, we say security should be built in and not bought on. Hype versus reality. Um, so when I'm presenting this at Cisco Live, uh, my, uh, my Cisco colleagues, especially in the business unit, always get a little bit nervous uh, when I'm doing this one, uh, because basically I'm saying, if you expect to be, with the love of your life, being the king of the world, but the reality is a, a little bit <laughs> um, less satisfying, you are uh, disappointed, and, and I, I want to prevent that. And when we talk about uh, Wi-Fi, we all want those big, shiny numbers. Uh, but in reality, I mean, Wave 2, when, when Wave 2 came, they started talking about 160 megahertz wide channels. Okay, who, who's ever deployed 160 megahertz wide channels? 
See, that's my point. More than four spatial streams. Okay, who's got a client with four spatial streams? <laughs> no one? Okay. Multi-user MIMO, yes. Well, uh, don't get me wrong, multi-user MIMO is gonna be very good, especially in 802.11ax, but today it's downstream only. So from an AP to a client, if the client supports it, and typically the client can only have one spatial stream for that. So 160 megahertz wide channels, the solution to all our bandwidth problems, well, if you look at the allocations of channels, then we don't really have the space to do that. I mean, we only can do one in, here in Europe. So looking at the number of spatial streams, um, the, the, the spatial streams and the, the, the qualm that's uh, uh, associated to it, we can get to 1.7 gig with four spatial streams, but this is the reality, and, and most of the clients are actually on two spatial streams. So 6.9 gig on an AP, yes, with eight spatial streams. Uh, Multi-user MIMO, downstream only. So what do you do when you look at an, uh, a new access point. And yes, uh, wave two is important, but I would, I would say look far, uh, much further than just uh, the, uh, the access point, just, uh, just the wave two spectrum. Look at all the features that come in a chipset, okay? And yes, this is the, the, the summarization for uh, my portfolio, but the same goes for a Ruckus, the same goes for an Aerohive, for a, for a uh, uh, Aruba. Look into, what is extra in the chipset, because that gives you uh, the advantages, and look at what the software brings you. That's where the difference is. Don't focus too much on the Wave 2, because in my opinion, that is more marketing than reality. So, Wave 2 is nice, but the magic is in the HDX, or for, uh, if you want to make it more general, Wave 2 is nice, but the magic is in the chipset and the software. So, film number seven. No site survey or no good site survey. Make sure that when you survey, you know for sure that if you say drywall, that it is really drywall, okay? And the most important spot to do, uh, to not forget on a site survey is? Yes. It's important to the site survey everywhere. And honestly, uh, this is the most common place that people use uh, Wi-Fi, yes. You can actually see that uh, from, a, uh, from a user's perspective. So the site survey tool is uh, Ekahau. Uh, I think you have an, uh, an, a demo uh, with it as well uh, in the break. So I'm not gonna go into the demo here. But the simple rule here is no survey, no Wi-Fi. So we made it halfway. How far are we on the time? Uh, 15 minutes to go. 15 minutes to go, okay. All right, I'm gonna rush it. So, like-for-like uh, -like replacement, that's fill number eight. And I think we had this conversation yesterday during dinner as well. Mm. I had a customer that uh, wants to replace 1142 access points with uh, our new 4800s. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm really happy with that. But just taking one out and putting another one in, it, it doesn't work like that. So um, you decided to upgrade. Well, that's not a fail. Um, I'm gonna share with you another scan that I did on uh, Wi-Fi. This is another scan here in the UK. It's a hotel where I stay quite often. And they had the Cisco 2600 series of access points. Now the 2600 series of access points are 802.11n dual radio. 802.11n dual radio, bandwidth should be around 300 megabits per second, right? But what you see here is that all are on G and in A mode. So what they did, they said, you know what? We're gonna replace them. Okay. Uh, I'm okay with that, but I think that the issue was in configuration uh, and the real issue that they have here was that they turned off wireless multimedia. And wireless multimedia is a mandatory setting in 802.11n. So the moment you turn that off, it falls back on previous. But anyway, they decided to replace their access points and now they have all new access points. And I'm very happy with that. However, the Wi-Fi is still not performing. They put all the channels on channel 36. So it tells me that even to date, and this is a scan that I did uh, about three, four months ago, 
we still don't give enough attention to uh, the basics about Wi-Fi. Uh, the good news is that channel one, six, and 11. That one is good now, yes. So like for like upgrades, uh, 1142 is not the same as the 2802, and the 2802 with external antenna is not the same as the one with integrated antenna. So simple rule number eight, survey for the access points you will install. They have a different radio pattern, okay? Taking out 1142 and putting in a 2800 is not uh, the proper way to do it. So you should do a new side survey for that. Fill number nine, BYOA. Anyone? Bring your own access point, very good. So we already know BYOD. Um, some companies, uh, well, most companies uh, support it nowadays, um, but not everyone means the same thing. So um, uh, with some companies, it brings your own dog. Uh, and yes, this is again a picture in a Cisco office. This is Meraki, and there you can bring your dog. Um, so we're gonna talk about BYOD. No, we're, we're not. Um, Although some people take that pretty far. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to talk about uh, BYO, uh, bring your own AP. And uh, yes, you will be surprised by the number of um, rogue uh, access points that you see in uh, enterprise environments. Uh, especially in larger environments, we still see these devices popping up and someone uh, had in his room uh, uh, in, in, in improper uh, Wi-Fi coverage, so he decided to take his own access point from home and plug it in the wall. Uh, another thing that we see a lot today is that people put on their uh, access point on tethering mode, and uh, their phone on tethering mode, and, and connect uh, a rogue Wi-Fi like that. Uh, of course, in an enterprise environment, it, it's not secured with your network credentials, uh, you're not doing 802.1x, uh, it might interfere, and basically you're creating an unmanaged infrastructure. Uh, so, how can you protect uh, an infrastructure like that? Well, you, you could do it like this. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's very efficient. Um, but in, in reality, I would say uh, a rogue AP should never have IP, okay? So, if you plug in a rogue access point into your infrastructure, your infrastructure should be so intelligent that it will not get an IP address, and that, so it cannot service any clients. Supporting legacy devices. Um, some people think that 802.11b, mind the capital, uh, is high speed internet access. And uh, we still have the conversation where they say we have to support B clients. Um, I would say uh, no. Uh, we, we don't have to support B clients anymore. I mean, that's, that's really, it's 2018, it's time to migrate. <coughs> uh, but when, when I'm talking to customers, they still give me feedback and say, we need to support our uh, barcode scanners and ABG is still uh, uh, on the table. And they, said, they tell me these barcode scanners, they were 2,000 quid when we bought them and uh, uh, they're still working, so we're not gonna replace them. Um, okay, how old are they? They're 15 years old. Okay, is it really not time to replace them? But no, we have to support them. I still had uh, a um, water facility company that uh, uses um, card bus cards, which were a uh, G standard. And uh, I didn't have a company that uh, wanted to still support this one, but I really wanted to put it in. Does anyone want, know what this is? It's the original iPhone. I didn't have a customer that uh, wanted to support it, but I did take the pictures and I was like, I have to put it in, so yeah. yeah. Uh, supporting legacy devices, um, it's, it's really important when you have this conversation with your customer, what type of clients are we talking about? What are the capabilities of these clients? And that, with that I mean, uh, what um, uh, round trip time do they need? Uh, what uh, bandwidth do they need? Really talk about what do they need? Uh, what applications and what are the requirements for that application and what is the required capacity. And, and with that, you can uh, uh, make a separate SSID for that particular uh, uh, legacy uh, device. So legacy devices should have a separate SSID. On SSIDs, uh, I think everyone knows, but I'm gonna emphasize it again, a maximum of four SSIDs on your uh, radio, okay? Um, it's not just Cisco, that's basically for all wireless uh, access points. And yes, I know the data sheet says that you can put in 16 SSIDs. 
but there's a, there's a very good reason why you only put a maximum of four SSIDs, because uh, you know that the SSID needs to be uh, broadcasted every, every so, so many seconds. And uh, let's say uh, I have one SSID, I'm telling my audience, uh, my name is Steven, I'm serving you as a client, and then I'm serving you as a client, I'm serving you as a client, my name is Steven, I'm serving you as a client, I'm serving you as a client. My name is, and now I'm gonna say two SSIDs. My name is Steven, my name is Martijn. I'm serving clients, serving clients. Serving. My name is Steven, my name is Martijn. Well, if I'm gonna have five names, I'm gonna be spending more time telling my name than servicing clients, okay? So, maximum of four SSIDs. Phil 11, design for coverage. Yes, still happening today. And basically, my recommendation is put your uh, lowest mandatory data rate on 12 meg megabits per second, and if you have enough access points, you would even increase that to 18 megabits per second. So basically what you're doing is you're uh, making smaller cells and you're creating a, a faster roaming decision. Keep in mind, roaming is always a client decision, okay? Client decides to roam. But by doing a, a smaller cell and a lower mandatory data rate, you will have a, a faster uh, roaming. So I can't say it enough, a smaller cell is better performance. Uh, it's not because I wanna sell you more IPs, okay? Yes, I, I love selling you more IPs, but that's not the reason why I want you to create smaller cells. It's because you deserve good Wi-Fi. And well, in case you still don't believe it, you can put in an extra strong antenna and see the, uh, the results. So simple rule number 11, a smaller cell equals better performance. Fill number 12, another one that uh, the Cisco uh, uh, commission didn't really like, because uh, my simple rule on, on, on uh, fill number 12 is, uh, dirty air is like dirty underwear. <laughs> you should get rid of it as soon as possible. So, some examples of dirty air. Um, uh, normally I would do a demo here on the, uh, uh, on the sidekick, but we don't have enough time for that. Um, but there are a lot of devices that create dirty air. And uh, basically, I want all of you in the room to become a wireless superhero. And uh, well, uh, a, a superhero always has uh, a sidekick. <laughs> Cow and chicken. What do they do? Try to take over the world, very good, yes. So here I am, this is, uh, this is me, and uh, this is my sidekick. There we go. So normally I do a demo now on the, on the sidekick, and I, uh, I show four or five sources of interference. And basically, uh, the one that, that I want to highlight here is uh, uh, non-Wi-Fi cameras. So uh, uh, here I'm doing a demo of a non-Wi-Fi camera and how that interferes, and it is huge. And I also uh, created a, 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 um, a video uh, showing uh, how a drone is interfering with Wi-Fi. And I wanted to do this live in the audience in Cisco Live. There were uh, close to 800 people in the room, and the Cisco Live uh, organization said, why did you bring a drone? I said, I'm gonna fly the drone in the room. You said, you're gonna do what? <laughs> So it was not allowed. Um, but the thing that I want to, to highlight, uh, uh, the, the sidekick is a perfect tool to give you uh, a view of what's happening in the air and uh, if there's uh, dirty air, basically. It will tell you what is the source, how strong is the source, how strong is the impact. Uh, but the sidekick is only there with you when you are on that moment. Um, nowadays, you can also add a sensor into your network that does the same thing from a client perspective. So it's looking from a client perspective how the air is performing and m making sure that you can still do the monitoring even though you are not on site. So simple rule number 12, dirty air is like dirty underwear. You should get rid of it as soon as possible. Fill number 13, listen to the architect. And I'm talking about the real estate architect, not you as the architect. So we have to listen to the architect, uh, that's really something, and uh, they are uh, pretentious. <laughs> and basically they told me that my access points are ugly. Thank you. So um, what do you do with things that are ugly? 
well, I know some examples of things that are ugly. <laughs> Anyone owns a multiplier? <laughs> no? Good. I had it presented as someone in the front row. I said, I have that one. <laughs> <laughs> OK, someone else owns Crocs? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we agree they're ugly, right? OK. Uh, so you can uh, tune them. <laughs> but let's be honest, there is. They're still not the nicest. Uh, you can take it all the way, then it becomes really funny, <laughs> but it's still not, uh, uh, not, not perfect. So, so what do you do with, uh, with things that are ugly? Well, one step back, uh, in Wi-Fi, it's important that you put your access points where your clients are, okay? So even though your clients are, um, even though you don't like the, to see the access points, and this is a, an auditorium and you have a lot of clients here, you still should put your access point uh, visible. And the reason for that, this is the technical overview, and I made, again, I made a very simple one for this, so this is my version. You have a transmitter and a receiver, and basically when you put uh, an uh, object in between, like for instance a ceiling, you will have uh, um, uh, uh, less uh, coverage. And especially if there's two, then you will see that the transmitter to the receiver, uh, there's an issue. So if you want to install access points and uh, you want to uh, make them look good in the environment, use proper installation mechanisms to do that. The RF uh, mathematics, I don't have to explain this in this audience, so that saves another 10 minutes. Um, so um, basically, the maximum transmission power is 20 de decibel to the milliwatts, which is 100 milliwatts. You can order the t-shirt with me if you want. <laughs> um, but basically, the, if you have a, a 3 dB loss, that uh, uh, half, uh, the, the signal becomes half. So um, keep in mind that 70% of the clients in your network are what kind of devices? Exactly. And they have a maximum of 14 dBm at max. So that means that if we have our transmitter and our receiver, and uh, we're now gonna flip them around so the uh, handheld device becomes the transmitter and the access point becomes the receiver. Actually, the signal is less, and now we put an object in between, and actually it doesn't uh, reach the access point anymore. So even though uh, it will have three bars reception, because, oh really? They really want me in the meeting, huh? You send a reminder. Even though um, the, um, uh, the client can uh, reach, sorry, even though the access point can reach the client and have three bars of reception, the client cannot reach the access point. So access points are ugly, is what our uh, real estate architect tells me. And then I'm asking them, so what about these? <laughs> They're not ugly? And they tell me, well, we have to uh, uh, install them. And I say, okay, so why don't you hide them? Guess what they tell me? They don't work. <laughs> Aha! <laughs> the same goes for Wi-Fi. So introducing the peephole AP. You've probably seen this as well. It works, it works. Um, this is a hotel, I mean. I can't imagine that this is what the, the architect had in mind when he said, I want you to hide the access points. So what I want to highlight here is that you can properly install them, that there are right ways to do that. Uh, you can even hide them in the wall. Uh, for outdoor Wi-Fi, there are very nice ones. Uh, you don't even see that there is access points in there. Uh, so uh, I have a simple rule, and this is my favorite one. The simple rule is, can you read the logo, you're probably good to go, okay? So if a uh, uh, one of your clients or customers is complaining to you about the performance of the Wi-Fi, the first question you should ask, can you see the logo of your access point? And I don't care what is the logo, it can be any vendor, any brand, can you see the logo? If the answer is yes, that means that there is another issue. If the answer is no, that would be my first thing to look at. If I can see the logo right now, it's on the ceiling. I know I'm in a close distance to the AP and it's not covered by a ceiling or a wall. 
If you cannot see the AP, that's the first thing to have a look at. Fail number 14, the installer is always right. So you made the perfect design. You designed for capacity, not for coverage. You designed for five gigahertz. You have proper channel overlap with 20 mega, 20% with minus 67 dBm at the edge. Uh, dual radio and high density environments suggested to work for 40 megahertz and 20 uh, megahertz in some areas. You have clean air and in sensitive areas and then the installer comes and takes your plan. He takes their interpretation. So he puts the AP where it's most convenient for them. By the way, this is another Cisco office. This is Cisco Amsterdam. So installers putting the access points on where it's most convenient for them. So the simple rule is, and I want to emphasize this, the moment when you hand over your design to an installer, emphasize that it's really important to put the access point where you designed it. Stick to the plan. Now keep in mind that not everything is better in wi without wires. And uh, there's a lot you can do wrong in Wi-Fi, but it's not always the Wi-Fi to blame. I mean, um, <laughs> these are real pictures, and we, we, we see this. And this is another real picture. Can anyone see what is the issue here? Yeah? So this is a fiber cable, and the moment when you close the door, the, the cable breaks. Okay, so it's not always the Wi-Fi to blame. Uh, there's a lot you can do right, and uh, with a little bit of understanding uh, and, and reading about the technology, you can explain a lot on uh, how to do things better. So it's stick to the plan, but um, be careful. If you talk to the installer and say, I really want it to be in exactly that spot, um, they could drill a hole into, <laughs> this is a picture from Iceland. It, again, it's a real picture. So, that's the end. Uh, the famous 14, you can reach out to me on Twitter and I, can, uh, I summarized it into a two-page document. Uh, it's free, you can use it, you can post it whatever you want, you can print it out, hand it over to your customers, do whatever you want with it. Uh, all I want is that everyone uh, gets better Wi-Fi. So, if you think hiring a professional is expensive, wait till you hire an amateur. <laughs> but if you search, there's always someone willing to do it cheaper. <laughs> Thank you very much.